Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Palm Sunday worship here at Holy Nativity. We are, as always, sad that you are not here with us, but we are glad that we can celebrate together in this way. I have my palm here and hope that you have yours. Maybe you have made, this is the palm of my hand, um, and I have colored it green. Maybe you have this kind of palm. Maybe you went outside and got yourself an actual branch. Whatever it is, I hope you have something to wave as we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem this day. A couple of announcements. We are doing our first ever virtual fellowship after worship this morning. It will be from 10.30 to 11.30 or whenever we're done talking to each other. Um, you've been sent the link for that. So it's really as easy as clicking the link and your computer system should do the rest. We hope to see some of you there with coffee and whatever treat you can scrounge up at home. This is Holy Week, obviously. Palm Sunday kicks us off. And we want to remind you that we will be live streaming both Monday, Thursday and Good Friday worship. So this Thursday and Friday at 7 p.m., You'll be able to watch live as we worship together this Holy Week. And of course, next Sunday, Easter Sunday, will be at 9.30 as always. More information is going to be coming out soon, but we want to let you know that the church staff has decided to have Holy Communion both Monday, Thursday, and Easter Sunday. So we want to prepare you for this. So later today, actually, I'll be making a little video with some preparation instructions for your at-home virtual communion. But we know this is a really important part of many of our faith journeys to commune. And so we want to do that in a thoughtful and um, respectful way. So I will be posting some video and we'll be sending some instructions about things to gather at your home, but please know that that is coming, and so stay tuned for that information. I think that's all announcement-wise, so I invite you to turn to page two in your bulletin as we prepare ourselves for worship together. And as always, we gather in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who is present, who gives life, who calls into existence the things that do not exist. Amen. If you are to keep watch over sins, O Lord, who could stand? Yet with you is forgiveness, and so we confess. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned away from you, knowingly and unknowingly. We have wandered from your resurrection life. We have strayed from your love for all people. Turn us back to you, O oh God. Give us new hearts and right spirits that we may find what is pleasing to you and dwell in your house forever. Amen. Receive good news. God turns to you in love. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live, says our God. All your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the free and abounding gift of God's grace for you. Amen. We continue our worship together by singing our gathering hymn. This would be a perfect time to get those palms waving. <laughs>
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. For the reign of God and for peace throughout the world, for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. For your people here who have come to give you praise, for the strength to live your word, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Help, save, and defend us, O God. together our prayer of the day. Sovereign God, you have established your rule in the human heart through the servanthood of Jesus Christ. By your spirit, keep us in the joyful procession of those who with their tongues confess Jesus as Lord and with their lives Praise him as Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Our first reading is from Isaiah. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. Holy wisdom, holy words. Our second reading is from Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Holy wisdom, holy words. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. It is a well-known story, the beginning of Holy Week, Palm Sunday. Jesus processes into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey with crowds of people lining the streets, waving palm branches and laying their cloaks on the road as Jesus rides over them. And as Jesus rides by, the people shout, Hosanna! The first thing for us to realize, perhaps, is the meaning of that word. Hosanna. It sounds like a word of joy, a word of anticipation, a word maybe of hope, and it is in a way. But what it literally means is save us. This is what the people are shouting at Jesus as he rides by. Save us. Which begs the question, save us from what? What do the people of that time and of that place need saving 
from. Maybe by looking at who the main adversaries of Jesus are, we can get a sense of the answer to that question. The first is the Roman Empire. Certainly many in that time and that place would have sought salvation from the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire ruled by force and oppression. They overtaxed their people. They required compliance. And they forbid any questioning of authority. They sent soldiers into any town or city where there was any hint of rebellion or uprising. The peace of Rome came through power. It came through the willingness to violently squash any potential threat to that power. The other main adversary, of course, of Jesus was the religious authorities, the scribes and Pharisees, the temple leadership, those in charge of the religious institution. And again, there would have been many who would have sought salvation from a religion that was often used to exclude, a religion that focused on following the law without considering the gospel, a religion that was more interested in keeping people out than drawing people in. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not in any way a criticism of Judaism, There have been many Christians throughout history who have operated in much the same way. Instead, this is a criticism of using religion as some sort of gatekeeper that controls access to God and controls who is in and who is out. Now, as we know and as we will hear as we get deeper into Holy Week, it will be these two forces that will conspire to kill Jesus. And for a little while, at least, it will seem that these calls of Hosanna, these calls of save us, will have all been for naught. But what is difficult for us to understand is just how different the salvation that Jesus offers us is from what we might expect. And that different understanding of salvation comes from a very different understanding of a Messiah, Because that is what the people were expecting, what the people were hoping for. Those people shouting Hosanna. They were looking for a Messiah, God's chosen one. And this Palm Sunday procession helps us understand just how different this Messiah, Jesus, is from what the people would have expected. The first thing to notice in this story is just how odd this procession really is especially compared with the alternative. Because the alternative was likely already happening on the other side of the city. As I mentioned, the Roman Empire liked to control the people, especially when they were worried about a rebellion. And any time a group of people gathered together, especially for religious reasons, Rome got worried. And the context of this week, Holy Week in Jerusalem, of course, is Passover. Passover was the most important Jewish festival, and Jewish people from all over the region would have flocked to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. This was a big deal. And Rome knew that this was a big deal. And they knew that there was a risk that the people might start conspiring against Rome. So every year at Passover, they would send in Roman soldiers into Jerusalem to monitor the situation, and these soldiers would march in in a parade, in a procession, probably led by King Herod riding on a war stallion. And the people would line the streets, probably shouting Hosanna and cheer, so as not to appear unpatriotic. Jesus, along with everyone else, would have known that this was going on. So when Jesus organizes this procession, and it's very clear that Jesus organizes this, he plans this, he is intentionally mocking the Roman Empire, the other Roman procession. He's offering an alternate image of a king to the people. A king not riding on a war stallion, but instead riding on a donkey. Which seems almost silly but was instead probably meant to be a sign of service and a sign of weakness. Jesus was not interested in the kind of power that Rome was peddling. 
So here's something about this story that I think we sometimes get confused. For a long time, I always pictured this story of Palm Sunday with crowds of people lining the streets, all excited for Jesus to come by, waiting for him, cheering for him, which is what made it so confusing when seemingly these same crowds were then shouting for Jesus' crucifixion just a few days later. But the way Matthew tells the story, that isn't exactly how it went down. Instead, these crowds of people who are shouting Hosanna are actually the crowds of people who have already been traveling with Jesus. Throughout the gospel, we hear that there are crowds following Jesus everywhere he goes, crowds of people. Jesus was not just traveling with his 12 disciples. There was a much larger crowd of people who were with him and listening to him and observing him and following him. And it would seem that Jesus uses this crowd to create this alternate parade. Because as Matthew tells it, it is the crowds who went ahead of him and followed behind him who were shouting, Hosanna. It was his followers who were shouting, Hosanna. Who were processing with him. Who were doing the cheering and the shouting. This becomes clearer at the end of the story when we hear that Jesus finally gets into the city and there is another group of people, the people of the city of Jerusalem, and we hear that the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? And then the crowds answered, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. So you have the crowds in Jerusalem in turmoil, which of course they would be in turmoil, because they can see what's going on. They can see that Jesus and his crowd are openly mocking the Roman Empire and their parade. And then you have the crowds of Jesus' followers who answer them. So it is clear from right here that the people gathered in Jerusalem for Passover are not sure about this Jesus claim. Who is this? What does he think he's doing? Does he want to get himself and us killed? He doesn't seem like much of a Messiah, much of a Savior. Because of course he doesn't. Jesus is not who anyone would have expected in a Messiah. If anything, Jesus should have been powerful. He should have rivaled Rome in his strength. He should have raised an army and physically overthrew the Roman Empire but that is not the kind of Messiah we get. That is not the kind of Savior we get. Because that is not the kind of God we have. So it strikes me that we might be looking for some salvation today in our current situation. Salvation from this pandemic, from this virus. Maybe salvation from isolation. Salvation from seclusion, from stay at home, maybe from fear. And what we might like is for God to come down here and just stop it. Just as the people of the of first century Galilee would have liked God to just send in a Messiah to wipe out the Roman Empire. But that isn't how God works. We don't have a God who is interested in power. We have a God who is interested in weakness, in suffering, and in dying. Which is not what most people would expect in God, of course. But what that means is that when we are suffering, when we are weak, when we even are dying, God is right there in the midst of it. Because God has been there. God knows. The mistake we often make is thinking that God will save us by simply removing us from tough situations. If we just have enough faith, or if we just pray hard enough, God will save us in this way. But instead, we have a God who, who first doesn't rely on us having enough faith, or praying hard enough, or doing anything. But also we have a God who gets right down into the midst of our lives, no matter what might be going on. 
So with Jesus' followers on Palm Sunday, we too can shout, Hosanna, save us. And we trust that Jesus will save us, but maybe not in the way we expect. Jesus will save us by experiencing our lives with us, by intimately connecting with us even when we are isolated, even when we feel alone, especially when we feel alone. Even when we're just fed up with everything that's going on. And Jesus will be fed up too, right with us. Jesus will experience all of those things with us. And maybe that is the Messiah that we really need. A God who walks with us even to the point of suffering and death. Because that is a God who truly knows us and truly understands us. And that is truly remarkable. And that is what we need right now. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue to worship God with our offering. We encourage you to mail in your offering to the church or to make an online donation. You can do that right at our website. We know that these are crazy times, and we are so grateful for your continued generosity and support of the ministries here at Holy Nativity. And now, Pastor Jason is going to have children's time. All right. Come on up. I don't know. This is, yeah. Move close to the screen. I don't know. Good morning. So, <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a secret, children. I rely mostly on your responses to my questions to kind of make the children's sermon happen. So this is a little difficult. But uh, I encourage you to answer the questions that I might ask you. Tell your parents or, you know, and, and maybe I'll check the Facebook feed later to see what you said. All right, so have any of you ever been to a parade? Yeah. Oh, all of you have. Oh, awesome. All right. I thought maybe you had. So what is your favorite part of a parade? Candy. Can, oh, candy. Oh, hey, we have some good participation here. Can, candy is probably the number one answer, yeah? When they throw candy at the parade. I like the marching bands. Marching bands, yes. That was, would have been one of, one of my uh, top answers, the marching bands. Yeah? What else? Anything else? What? The Shriner oh, the Shriner go-karts. Yes, those are awesome. And how they don't hit each other when they're doing their little... Yeah, that's kind of crazy. The floats, oh, and the Rose Parade, I'm sure those are phenomenal, yeah. Fire trucks. Fire trucks? 
Yeah, 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 there you go. I always used to love the, uh, the horses. They're usually horses in parades that I went to. I don't, usually they're at the end for maybe obvious reasons. But uh. <laughs> So then I was going to ask, what is your favorite parade that you've ever been to? And I'm guessing you know, maybe the, the Rose, Rose Parade. It's just the Rose Parade, yeah. Rose Parade. Um, Aquatennial Parade. That's a good parade, yeah. Fourth of July Parade, Fourth of July parade the, the quintessential parade, yeah. I had a parade growing up that I went to every year, and actually I still try to go to every year. Um, the town that my grandparents lived in when I was growing up was Amory, Wisconsin. So we would go to Amory every year. They have, their town festival was in the fall. Most town festivals are sometime in the summer. Their town festival was in the fall, and it was called the Amory Fall Festival, and we would go every year to the parade. And since I, ever since I was like one year, a, a year old, my parents would take me to this parade every year, and we'd visit my grandparents, and go to the parade and stake out our spots early and get our candy and watch all the, all the, they had a lot of marching bands. It was a lot of fun. So I'm thinking about parades, maybe for obvious reasons. It's Palm Sunday, of course, and Palm Sunday, the main story of Palm Sunday is kind of a parade. I don't know, maybe you haven't thought about it that way. But Jesus has kind of a parade. He's kind of a one-person parade, I guess, although his followers are with him, so it's larger. And he has his parade into Jerusalem. And this is a very important parade because this is the start of perhaps the most important week, well, certainly the most important week of our story, of the Christian story, Holy Week. So Jesus is marching into Jerusalem, and it seems all exciting, and people seem happy, and they're shouting Hosanna, and they're saying, save us, Jesus. But we know that quickly things are going to turn, and this is the week where, of course, Jesus will die on Good Friday, but then we also know that there's hope, because that death does not last. And, of course, Easter is next Sunday, and we're, we're getting close. So this is the beginning of that most important week, and we're worshiping on Thursday and Friday, so hopefully you can watch and be a part of that and, of course, be here on Easter Sunday as well. So it's, it's a, a powerful week, um, a week that we're sad that we can't all be together, and, uh, but we will do it as best we can, and it's going to be a great week. So thank you, kids, for your participation and for coming up. You can go back to your seats. <laughs> Turning our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. God of mercy, awaken your church to new proclamations of your faithfulness. By your Spirit, give us bold and joyful words to speak, that we sustain the weary with the message of your redemption. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mercy, quiet the earth where it trembles and shakes. Protect vulnerable ecosystems, threatened habitats, and endangered species. Prosper the work of scientists, engineers, and researchers who find ways to restore creation to health and wholeness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mercy, drive away fear and anger that cause us to turn against one another. Give courage to leaders who seek liberation for the oppressed. Bring peace and hope to those who are in prison and those who face execution. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mercy, send your saving help to all who suffer abuse insult, discrimination, or contempt. Heal the wounded, comfort the dying, bring peace to those suffering chronic or terminal illness, tend to all who cry out for relief, especially Doug Hanna and the family of Burl Scobie. And again, this day we ask that you hold all people affected by our global pandemic, the sick, the dying, the caregivers, the isolated, the lonely, the unemployed, and all people who need your love and care this day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
God of mercy, we pray for your presence among us this holy week. In all things, show us the way that you call us to, the way of dying to self, living for you, and giving ourselves for the sake of others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. According to your steadfast love, O God, hear these and all our prayers as we commend them to you. Through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the light of God surround us, the love of God enfold us, and the presence of God watch over and protect us. For wherever we are, our God is also there. We close as we began in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing together our final two verses of our mission hymn. Don't forget to wave your palms. Before we dismiss, I want to encourage you, if you made your own palms, to take pictures and post your palm waving on our Facebook page or to mail in the palms that you made so we can create an art installation here at church that you'll be able to enjoy when you're back. And now, go in peace, share the good news. Thanks be to God.